judgment in the Lehman Brothers Holdings Appeals. These appeals arise from the 2008 collapse of the Lehman Brothers Group, and they raise a number of technical questions of insolvency law. The group's European trading company was an unlimited company, LBIE, whose shares were owned by LBHI2 and LBL. All three companies have been in administration since January 2009. LBIE appears to be able to repay its external creditors in full. The Insolvency Act 1986 and the Insolvency Rules 1986 contain detailed rules governing insolvency, but some judge-made rules still apply. Under the Act, an administrator of a company is permitted to make distributions to creditors in much the same way as a liquidator. The order in which unsecured, non-preferential creditors are normally paid out is provable debts, statutory interest, non-provable liabilities, shareholders or members. Rules 268 to 2105 deal with distributions by administrators to creditors with provable debts. In December 2012, the LBIE administrators paid an interim dividend to its unsecured creditors after having received proofs of debt from those creditors, including LBL and LBHI2. These appeals raise seven issues, the last four of which arise because LBIE's members or shareholders can be called upon to make contributions under Section 74 of the 1986 Act and because LBHI2 and LBL are liable to contribute in LBIE's insolvency as well as being creditors of LBIE. The first issue, does the claim of LBHI2 as holder of three subordinated loans made to LBIE rank ahead of statutory interest payable under Rule 288.7 and or ahead of non-provable liabilities? The answer turns on the interpretation of the loan agreements. The court unanimously rejects LBHI2's contention that statutory interest and non-provable liabilities are, quote, obligations not payable in the insolvency of LBIE, or that statutory interest is not, quote, payable and owing by LBIE. So LBHI2's claims rank behind statutory interest and non-provable claims as the courts below held. Second issue, as LBIE's foreign currency creditors will be, will be paid under Rule 286 at the exchange rate on the date LBIE went into administration and sterling may have depreciated between that date and the date on which those creditors are paid, can those creditors recover any contractual shortfall as a non-provable claim. The court concludes by a majority of four to one that Rule 286 spells out the full extent of a foreign currency creditor's rights. So they cannot claim as a non-provable debt the difference between the sterling value of the debt at the administration date and at the payment date. This is a view expressed in reports before 1986 the contrary conclusion would give a foreign currency creditor a one-way option, and unlike proofs for certain other debts, the 1986 rules contain no provision for adjustments to foreign currency debt proofs. Lord Clark dissents on this issue. Third issue. Can a creditor of LBIE who was entitled to, but has not been paid, statutory interest by the administrator claim such interest in a subsequent liquidation? The court unanimously answers no. Rule 288.7 constitutes a direction to an administrator while in office. In agreement with the judge and disagreeing with the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court considers it impermissible for a new judge-made rule to fill this gap. But, disagreeing with the judge, the Supreme Court 
also concludes that the contractual right to interest for the post-administration period does not revive where a creditor has been paid on his proof in a distributing administration. Four, can contributions under Section 74 be sought from LBHI2 and LBL to pay statutory interest or non-provable liabilities of LBIE? While the expression liabilities in Section 74 extends to non-provable liabilities, Rule 2887 provides that statutory interest is payable only where there is a surplus after payment of the debts proved. And disagreeing with the judge and the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court holds that Section 74 cannot be invoked to create a, quote, surplus, unquote, from which statutory interest can then be paid. The court, however, agrees with the courts below on the uh, non-provable liabilities. Fifth issue, can LBI prove in the administrations of LBHI2 and LBL in respect of the latter two companies' contingent liabilities to make contributions in LBIE's respective prospective liquidation if they are called on to do so pursuant to Section 150 of the 1986 Act? Contrary to the views of the courts below, the Supreme Court considers that the obligation to meet a possible future call made under Section 150 is incapable of being the subject matter of a proof unless the company concerned is in liquidation. Any money paid under such an obligation forms a fund which can only come into existence once that company is in liquidation. And if that company is not in liquidation, there is no identifiable potential creditor. Further, the alternative view would lead to serious difficulties. Sixthly, can LBIE exercise a right of set-off in respect of those contingent liabilities? Essentially for the same reasons, the court concludes that prospective Section 150 liabilities cannot be set off. Seventhly, can LBIE invoke the so-called contributory rule, which applies in a liquidation, so that LBHI2 and LBL cannot recover as, cover as creditors until their liabilities as contributories has been discharged. It's plainly inconsistent with the pari passu principle that all creditors are to be treated equally and with the statutory aim of enabling effective calls to be made in a liquidation to allow LBHI2 and LBL to be paid out as creditors until they have met their contributory liabilities especially as they may well be insolvent. In those circumstances, the contributory rule can properly be extended to a distributing administration with procedural modifications to achieve consistency with the legislative framework. To the extent indicated in our judgment, uh, the appeals and cross-appeals are allowed in part uh, and uh, dismissed in part. Court is now adjourned.